Now, Gangbusters, presented in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States. The only national program that brings you authentic police case histories. Gangbusters has asked the Honorable Peter F. Hartman, former Chief of Police, Quincy, Illinois, to narrate by proxy tonight's case. Now, Chief Hartman, before we begin, I'd like to remind our listeners about a special feature at the end of tonight's program. It shows how a girl of 12 and a boy of 14 helped capture a dangerous kidnapper. I'm quite anxious to hear that myself, Don Gardner. Well, Chief Hartman, let's get to tonight's case. Well, Don, it's not very often that a situation such as this arises in society. I've been a police officer myself for 23 years, and this was the first time I ever ran into anything like this case. Why don't you start right in, Chief Hartman? All right, Don. Let's begin in the city of Quincy, Illinois, one spring evening a few years ago. In a small two-story frame house near the International Shoe Company factory, a man sat on the living room sofa. He was there calling on Mrs. Angela Brooks Stover, already twice widowed. Angela was seated at the old melodeon, and the music coming forth seemed to be a hymn. Angie. What? Don't you know anything except church music? It's music, isn't it? I learned it when I was a child, and I've never learned nothing since. Well, you ain't a child now. My husband's like my playing. Both of them. (laughs) Is that what killed them? Will Heinze. I'm never going to invite you back for another evening. (laughs) Don't, then. Will. Huh? I baked a cake this afternoon. What kind of cake? Chocolate, with white inside. Well, let's have some. You know, I baked every day for both my husbands. Is that so? Every day. Now, look, Angie, you're not hooking me for number three, so if you're going to make hints, good night. Will, what's the matter with us getting married? Is there something about me you don't like? No, Angie, it ain't that, but... Certainly time he was getting married. Well, it's my father. There'd be nobody to look after him. Since when's he sick in bed and look after himself? It's you that's clinging to him. Now, wait a minute. I can take care of myself. If you didn't have that old goat to drag around with you, maybe you'd get someplace in this world. Pop is plenty smart. He's smart enough for me to listen to. You're just scared of him, that's all. Like any minute he was going to take you out in the woodshed. Like you were still running around in knee pants. That ain't so, Angie. You got more company? No. Well, who are you expecting? Nobody. I don't think anybody. Well, don't stand there. See, see who it is. All right. Yes, what? Oh, Mr. Heinze. Uh, yes, Mr. Heinze. Will, it's your father. I guess Will knows me when he sees me. But won't you come in, Mr. Heinze? I was just about to serve chocolate cake. Well, I like chocolate cake. Maybe it's good. Will, I want to talk to you. <laughs> A- Angie makes good chocolate cake, huh? The best. <clears throat> and I got some coffee up. Well, then go get it. Don't stand here talking about it. The eating is the proof of the pudding. All right. Make yourself at home, Mr. Heinze. I will. Well, what's the matter, Pop? Well, if I was a younger man, I'd take a stick and pound some sense into your head. Sit down. Oh, Pop, I don't really mean to marry Angie. Angie, huh? There was two policemen around the house looking for you. They said Clinger's hardware store was broken into, and they think you did it. Now, did you? Pop, I... Did you? Well, yeah. All these years I've been teaching you, all these years I've been trying to make a man out of you. I'm sorry, Pop. Too late to be sorry. Got no respect for your father. Why don't you at least wait until I'm in my grave? Pop, don't talk like that. Breaking into hardware stores. How many times have I got to tell you not to break into anything? Unless I say so. It looks so easy. It looks so easy. Now you're in trouble. Every time we got in trouble. Every time it's been on account of you running off and doing something like that. Ah, Pop. If it hadn't been for you, we wouldn't have spent that time in the Missouri State Prison. And that five years in Iowa. 
You're not much better than a child. Oh, Pop, I told you I was sorry. Being sorry is not going to chase them two detectives away from the house there. They're waiting for you. Uh-oh. I tell you, it's lucky for you your father has a good mouth on him. I told them I'd go out and find you, bring you to the police station. Oh, no, Pop, you're not. Well, I sure ought to. Yeah, but, but you ain't, Pop. It's huh? just lucky, Will, that you're my flesh and blood. It's just lucky for you. Well, what, what are we going to do, Pop? Now, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to do some traveling again. To a resort. To Spirit Lake. Spirit Lake? Where's that? It's up in Iowa near the Minnesota line. I saw an ad in the paper. The people that runs the cottages there need a couple of handymen. Handymen? We're not going to work, Pop. Just long enough to get a good look around the resort. Now we leave tonight. Spend all day chopping wood. <clears throat> Just so somebody can burn it up. Well, Fine job we got. Will? Uh, what, Pop? Put that axe up, Will. Mrs. Miller says dinner's on the table. It's about time. Where have you been all day? What's eating you, Will? A little work never hurt nobody. Uh, it can't hurt you. You never do any. Will, you have some respect. Well, I thought you said we'd only be around here long enough to find out where they keep their money. I thought you Don't told think me. so much. Now, come on inside. You know, the first guests will be coming soon, Pop. When the cottages get rented up, it'll be tougher and tougher to do what we gotta do. Well, you just leave all that to me. I'll tell you when. We can handle the millers, all right. They they won't be no trouble. Wipe your feet off. Oh, yeah, sure. Huh? Okay. Yeah. Hey, come in. It's on the table. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Miller. We got lamb stew. It's getting cold. Ah, lamb stew sounds pretty good, don't it, Pop? Yeah, it's awful good. Don't you uh, <clears throat> think you ought to wash your hands, Will? Oh, yeah, yeah, Pop. Hey, excuse me. I'll, I'll be right back. <sighs> Sit down, Pop. Thank you, Mrs. Miller. Sometimes Will calls you Pop as if you were really his Pop. Well, I guess it's natural him not having a father and a <laughs> together so long. My, everything sure looks good. Well, help yourself. <clears throat> Ain't uh, Mr. Miller going to eat with us? Oh, Mr. Miller went to town. He went to arrange for the bus. First guests are coming tomorrow. <clears throat> tomorrow? Well, <clears throat> that's uh, it's kind of early, ain't it? Uh, nights are still pretty cold for vacationing. Oh, we get lots of early guests. Oh, now take some more of that stew, Pop. That little bit isn't going to hold you till supper. Well, I'm all washed up. There, sit down, Will. Oh, and help yourself. Thanks, Miss Miller. Oh, that lamb stew looks awful good. Mm hmm. It is good, Will. Will, the uh, first guests are arriving tomorrow. Oh, no kidding. That's right. We're in for some real excitement. Yeah, I guess we are. Oh, that must be Mr. Miller calling from town. Excuse me, I'll get it. Help yourself to everything. Don't be bashful. Say, this um, lamb stew is good, Pop. Hang the lamb stew. Well, it's good. Mrs. Miller's a good cook. The guests coming early ruin everything. Well, what can we do about it? They're coming. I tell you what we can do. We can finish our business tonight. Tonight? That's what I said. Yeah, but we don't know where Mr. Miller keeps all the money. Well, we'll find it. But how are we going to have time to find it with them around? That's easy. We kill them. Kill them? Yeah. Oh, now, Pop, that ain't good. Now, you look here. Did I ever put you wrong yet, Will? The only times we've been in trouble is when you did something on your own. That's the only times. Yeah, but do we have to kill them? If we're going to find out what we want, yes. When? Tonight. After supper. In the parlor. But, Pop... Will, I made up my mind. Okay, if you made up your mind. Hmm, you're right, Will. Mrs. Miller does make good lamb stew. Very good lamb stew. So, Don, if the afternoon seemed like an eternity to Philip and William Heinze as they waited their moment, the events that night must have seemed to occur in a split second. But sometimes split seconds are remembered better than eternities by murderers and their pursuers. Now, back to gangbusters. You were telling us, Chief Hartman, 
that the criminals Philip and William Heinze, father and son, planned to murder and rob their employers, Mr. and Mrs. Miller, operators of a lakeside resort in northern Iowa. That's right, Don. And that night after supper, the two criminals were in the kitchen, about to enter the parlor, where, as usual, they were invited by the Millers to spend the evening. You do like I told you, and we'll come out all right. Oh, but, Pop, do we have to kill them? I told you we did. You just watch me for signal. Good evening, Mrs. Miller. Hello. Miller? Good evening. Good evening. Have a chair. Thank you. We will. Uh, how did it go in town today, Mr. Well, Miller? Fine, Will, just fine. Are you finished with the sports section, Mr. Miller? Yes, sir, it is on the couch. Oh, thank you. Big rainstorm in Chicago, it says. Is that so, Mr. Miller? Yes, it... Oh, where'd you get that gun? I'm going to use it to kill you, Mr. Miller. What? No! But you whole fool... Take care of her. Take care of her, I said. You crazy boy! Quiet! Hit her again. Now, yeah. oh, here, shoot her. Oh, no, Pop, you do it. Oh, I have to do everything. All your life I've been doing things for you. Now, here, you shoot her yourself. Go on. Shoot her. Pop, I... I said shoot her. And she might still be lying out there, her unconscious and Mr. Miller's body, if the bus driver hadn't come by with the guests. I think we've got a case, Sheriff. Well, this is Cousin's Furniture Store here. Oh, uh, before we go in, uh, besides being the leading furniture merchant and undertaker, Mr. Cousins is also coroner of the county. He'll probably want to talk to us about holding the inquest. I understand. Well, let's go on in. Afternoon, John. Afternoon, Sheriff. Mr. John Cousins, this is Agent Ike Welburn of the Iowa Bureau of Investigation. He came out from Des Moines to help with the case. Ah, glad to have you. We got a mystery on our hands. Uh, sit down here any place. It's all second hand stuff. Thanks. I hope I can help you solve that mystery. Well, Corpus Delicti is back in the undertaking department. How's Mrs. Miller? Well, the doctors give her a 50-50 chance, John. Mm. We got the slugs out of Mr. Miller's body. Looks like they came out of a thirty-two. Uh, both of them. We'll send them down to the laboratory in Des Moines for a complete ballistics check. Uh, what about these two men, the suspects? Well, the only time they were seen in town was the day they got off the train. And when was that? Oh, ten days, two weeks ago. They asked Chet North, the station agent, for directions to the Miller's place. Chet phoned out, and Miller drove in for him. I guess Mrs. Miller could give you more information about them than anyone else. Well, apparently Mrs. Miller won't be able to give that information for a while. If at all. If they'd already been hired by the Millers, must have been some correspondence between them. Well, my men certainly couldn't find anything. No payroll book, nothing. Nothing at all. You know, it's strange how the young one and the old one seem to travel together. Mr. Miller was talking about them at the feed store one day... He had an idea they were some kin, but uh, he never asked. Wasn't the nosy kind, as long as they did their work. They did their work all right. Come on, Sheriff, let's walk over to the depot and talk to that station agent. I want to see if I can make certain of the exact day they got off the train. Just a minute. Yes? Who is it? It's me, Angie. Will. Will! Uh, Will, where have you been? Where'd you disappear to for three weeks? Oh, Pop decided we should take a little trip. And you go away without telling me. Well, ain't you going to invite me in? Uh, Come in, Will. Much obliged, Angie. Now, tell me. Was that nice, what you did to me? No, Angie, it it, it wasn't, Angie. I don't know whether I even ought to ask you to stay. Angie, I'm through listening to my pop. I'm going to start doing things on my own. It's about time. More than about time. Well, just by coincidence, I made a chocolate cake today. You did? Would you like some? Later. But right now, would you play one of those hymns for me? A hymn? Yeah, a hymn. Well, sure, Will. If you want. 
Angie. Yes? Sometime in, in, in the near future, would you care to marry me? Oh, Will. I don't know what to say. Well, say what you said to the two before me. Say yes. I... Yes, Will. Yes. Oh, come to the church in the wildwood. Oh, oh come, come to the church, church in the bay. These phones would be best put the call through on, Sheriff. Yeah, you can tie this one up as long as you want, Welburn. Thanks. Yes, please. Operator, I want to place a call to the Chief Auditor, Rock Island Railroad, Chicago, Illinois. Yes, sir. I'll call you back. Thanks. Yeah, it looks pretty hopeless to me, Welburn. The railroad takes up thousands of tickets every day. I know they do, but each one of them is handled and audited individually. Now, if we can trace the ones these two men used for their passage to Spirit Lake, we might know where they came from. That's a big step in the investigation. No, I grant you that, but suppose they change trains at Des Moines or someplace. Then where are we? If they bought their tickets through to Spirit Lake when they left home, it doesn't make any difference how many times they change. The stamp of the originating office is on the back. If the railroad can locate those tickets, we've got a chance. Yeah, that's right. Maybe you've got something. Sheriff, it's all we've got. Where have you been, Will? You had me worried. The Quincy cops might still be looking for you on account of that hardware store. Just over to see Angie. But I thought I told you to stay away from her. She's been widowed twice and proposes to make you number three. I asked her to marry me, Pop. You, you what? Angie and I are going to get married. You won't marry her as long as I'm alive. I ain't listening to you no more, Pop. You got me in trouble all my life listening to you. Steal this, steal you that. You will. Turn me loose, Pop. You're my boy. You do what I say. Turn me loose. Uh, will. Push your poor old father, who's been nothing but good to you all your life. Oh, good to me? That's a laugh. Making me spend years and years in jail, making me steal and kill. You wouldn't have known what to do if it weren't for me. You wouldn't have known nothing. I wouldn't have killed nobody. You didn't even do a good job at that. I told you to kill her. You messed it up. You never did anything right. I can kill Pop if I want to. Angie and me are getting married, and if you step one foot in the way, I'll kill you. I swear I'll kill you. Agent Welburn. Mr. Welburn, Detective Watson, the Quincy, Illinois Police Department is ready to talk now. Well, good. Put him on. Hello, Welburn. Yes, Watson. How are you? Okay. I've been thinking about our phone conversation last night. Any ideas, Watson? You say those two definitely bought their railroad tickets here in Quincy. That's what the railroad says. Well, I don't want to make any promises, Welvin. Maybe I know the men you're looking for. Father and a son. That could be. The name's Heinze. We've suspected them at a couple of burglaries around here. They disappeared about three weeks ago. But I could start checking around for them. It's a good idea, Watson. You start checking and I'll start driving. And I'll see you there as quick as I can make it. To the church in the veil. No place is so dear to my child. I, I never heard such pretty music. Pop. Evening, Mr. Heinz. You get your hat, Will. We're going. How did you get in here? I got a knack of getting places, Will. You know that. You get your hat. Go on, Angie. Finish playing. But will I? Finish playing. <laughs> Will, tell him to go home. I can't stand the sight You're of him. You're coming with me, Will. No more. You're not telling me what to do. Will. You stupid old Stay fire. away from me, Pop. Will. Put that gun up. Stay away, and you too, Angie. Oh, Will. Shut up, Angie. All these years, I've been taking lessons from you, Pop. So right now, I'm going to show you what I will, learned. Will, you wouldn't shoot your own father now. Not after all we've been to each other. You've never been anything to me. All my life, I, I've been scared of you. Now I'm not scared no more. Will, don't You'll shoot him. you get some him. sense, boy. I'm get just sense. beginning to get some sense, boy. Sit down, Pop. I'm going to shoot you just like you shot Mr. Miller. Will, my boy. Sit down. Will, don't do this to me. Ah! Hey. Police officers, don't move. Yeah, well, I... Don't move. Got a half a dozen guns on you. Oh, Will. Yo, lady. Open the door. Don't do it, Angie. Open the door. All right. One side. 
That's it. Just keep your hands up. He's my son, officer. We were only joking. I was neither joking. If there's any humor in this situation, it's beyond me. And you won't think it's so funny either when you face the judge and the jury. That done was how this strange pair of killers, father and son, were apprehended. They were returned to Iowa where they were found guilty of murder in the first degree. On March 29th, 1946, Philip and William Heinze paid the extreme penalty for their crime on the gallows at Fort Madison State Penitentiary. Well, thank you, Chief Hartman, for this most unusual case history. And gangbusters, congratulations to all the police officers whose brilliant investigation brought this pair to justice. Now, as a special feature, Gangbusters presents an interview with the two young listeners who are responsible for the apprehension of the dangerous kidnapper, John Harvey Bug, whom they recognize from the description given on a Gangbusters clue. Here they are from the studios of KEX, ABC's new 50,000-watt outlet in Portland, Oregon. Hello, I'm Pauline Virgin, age 12. I'm a Girl Scout. And I'm Navar Smith, 14, Andy Boy Scout. Well, Pauline and Navar, you've had quite an exciting week. And now you're on Gangbusters. Why don't you just go ahead and tell all these millions of people just how it happened? All right, Mr. Hunter. You see, we live in Gearhart, Oregon. And uh, everybody... Gearhart's about uh, 80 miles from Portland, isn't that right, Pauline? Yes, sir. Well, you see, I took riding lessons from Cowboy Jim. Mm-hmm. And, uh... I one night when Saturday night when I was listening to Gangbusters, I heard the description of him, and it said that he had the limp and the tape on his fingers. Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, what was what was the description that they gave in Gangbusters? Did they say he had his fingers taped? Yes, he did. Oh, I see. And then this cowboy Jim had his fingers taped too. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, you were pretty suspicious then, weren't you? Yes, I was. Well, what did you do about it? Well, I told my cousin Navar. Smith. Oh, I see. Uh, Navarre, what did, how did you feel about this whole thing? Well, I thought if the FBI wanted this kidnapper, that the best thing to do was to turn him in. I went over to Seaside and turned him in to the policeman there. You turned the kidnapper in? No, I asked him where I could get in touch with the FBI, but... Oh, I see. He uh, asked me why, and I told mm-hmm. him, and so he says that he would do it for us. Mm-hmm. Well, did you talk to your mother about it, Pauline, at all? Yes, I did, and she kind of laughed. So oh, I see. Was... Well, you didn't let that bother you at all, though, did you? No. Well, uh, you uh, you say the policeman now was uh, was going to do what for you? He was going to turn him into the FBI for us. Well, I see, and he certainly did from all the activity we've seen around here in the last week. Agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation did some checking, and they found out that Cowboy Jim really was the kidnapper, John Harvey Bug. And they found him hiding under the baby crib in a friend's house last Friday night. Uh, Tell me something, Pauline. Uh, What did your mother say after it was all over? Well, she was kind of thrilled about it. She didn't think it could happen. Well, she kind of admitted, too, that kids can be right sometimes, didn't she? (laughs) Well, you and Navarre certainly were right and observant, too. And now, on behalf of gangbusters, I want to present each of you with a check for $100. Oh, boy. And uh, we hope you'll continue to be observant young citizens. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Thank you. Now, this is Ben Hunter, transcribed from the studios of KEX Portland, Oregon, switching you back to gangbusters in New York. Thank you, Pauline Virgin and Navarre Smith. And gangbusters, congratulations to both of you. Tonight's case was dramatized by Stan Niss and directed by Ted Corday, with Bill Smith and Bill Zuckert in leading roles. Don Gardner speaking. <laughs>